All right, so N is 16. Now I can just plug that into here and then just solve for D, which I'm not gonna do because it's literally just algebra. The main reason why I'm doing this is to showcase the way that I would approach solving these questions. Okay, how do I do this? Let's see, so five, five times one. The rest is just plugging numbers in and then taking the antiderivative. All right, welcome everybody. I have the math. 2022 AAHL exam here on my left hand side. All right, I have not looked through the exam. I don't know what to expect. A few disclaimers before I begin. I have not studied the math curriculum. All right, I did a brief review of topic number one. So really the only exposure I have so far is of topic number one. And what I'm thinking of doing in this video is just going through the entire exam in the next 15 minutes. Okay, so the main reason why I'm doing this is to showcase the way that I would approach solving these questions. All right, what are the ahas? How do I identify those limiting constraints that we talked about in the math? training that I did previously. And really, how do I go about practicing these questions? Because what you need to focus on when it comes to really mastering math and really just any subject is doing as many questions as possible in as few of a time, right? You want to just become a factory, do as many as you possibly can. When you do that, you got to realize that there are certain attributes of the question that you just got to ignore, right? That's how you get through huge quantities by focusing in on the points that are the most important, right? What are those stumbling blocks, those constraints that prevent you from achieving success in this subject area? All right, so let's see what we got here. This question, I can already tell I can get this very, very easily. And just looking at this, it looks like it got ripped out of the SL curriculum part. Maybe. I'm not sure how exactly how the AA tests are the HL part. I'm not sure. Maybe maybe the first question is from the SL. Maybe it's not. I know for sure, though, that the SL AA rips off one of the first questions of the HL and puts that onto the SL. That as much as I know. This is probably one of those questions. So let's do it real quick. We have the end term of arithmetic sequence, excuse me, is this. State the value of the first term. All right. Well, we can just write down the formula, right? UI or U1, excuse me. So if we rewrite u1, we know that u1 is simply un minus n minus 1 times d. All right, so that's the formula. We go back here. We know that un is this. So let's just plug this in here. We get 15 minus 3n minus n times d plus d. Factor this out. So we get 15 plus d is equal to negative, what is this, 3 plus d. Of All right, well, cool. so that's the first value given that the n term of the sequence is n 3 Find the value of n. So let's just equate these two. b, we know that the nth term of the sequence, so in other words, u of n is equal to negative 3, 3. We need to find the value of n. All right, so just what I would do is plug this in. All right, so we want to find what the value of n is in this case, and we just simply divide this way, we're going to get a bunch of canceling with the negatives that happen. So we get D plus what is this 33, 48, 48 divided by three plus D and it should be negative. So the negatives cancel out, then find the common difference D. Hmm. Realize that there's actually a much easier way. So I know that this is true. So we can actually utilize this, but I just realized that the nth term U of N is equal to negative three, three, which basically means that negative 3, 3, negative 33, excuse me, is equal to 15 minus 3n. All right, so I didn't realize that you could just utilize the first equation. Now we can simply, let's say we can simply solve for that. So bring 3n here, we get, what is this, 48? That is what, 16, I want to say, 16, 3, yeah, 16. All right, so n is 16. Now I can just plug that into here and then just solve for d, which I'm not going to do because it's literally just algebra. All right, at this point, it's just algebra. Cool, so we're already five minutes into my 15 minutes. Let's go on to the next one. Consider any three consecutive integers prove that the sum of these three integers is always divisible by three. Interesting, interesting one. So prove that the sum of these three integers is always divisible by three. Well, glad that you asked. Let's do some right hand, left hand stuff. So right hand side is equal to negative one, which is the first integer plus n plus n plus one. Boom, what do we get? Minus one, minus one is equal to three n. Well, if left hand side is divisible by three, that means that I can get the left hand side and multiply by some constant m, where m is just some, where m is some integer. Hence, if the if I make the right hand side equal to the left hand side right here, all right? Turns out that if I get three n is equal to three m, I could basically rewrite the left hand side as three times some number m like this. And since m is just some positive integer or just some integer, excuse me, not, not doesn't need to be doesn't even need to be positive. Since m is just some integer right here, turns out that three of n is always some also some integer, excuse me, given that n is an integer. So this is just this is just property of sets three of n is some integer. Hence, we can think of this entire thing here as being was the best way to do this? I haven't done proofs in a while, but it should be pretty straightforward. I think given that this is two marks, I think it sh this should give you full marks already. Three of n right here, since this is some integer. The formal way to do this, I'd have to look at the mark scheme again. I don't remember from the top of my head, but for practice sakes, this should be okay, I would imagine. There's probably a better way to do this. Okay, let's do part B. 
of this question. So by the way, this should be part A. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's do part number B. So prove that the sum of the squares of these three integers is never divisible by three. So what I would do in this question is I would just start writing stuff. So let's see that the sum of the squares. So again, so I'm going to just do right hand side. Let's see. Let's see what ends up happening. I generally don't know. So let's see what happens. Sum of the squares is never divisible by three. Hmm. Okay, let's just, let's just see what happens if we expand this because I imagine something's going to happen. We get what? 2n plus 1 plus n squared plus 1. Let's just double check that that's correct. 2n, 2n. Cool. So this is the part that I shouldn't be spending that much time on. This, boom, boom. We get 3n squared plus 2. Aha. All right, so now it should be pretty obvious as to why this is never divisible by 3 because the logic here is that we know that this right here is always going to be divisible by 3. In fact, it is divisible by 3 because we proved it in part number 2. And then the rest of the question just comes down to proving that if we have something that's divisible by 3, so this is something, I believe the, the symbol is this. I may be incorrect. It's like m divisible by 3 line. I think it's like the pipe simple, meaning that it's divisible by 3. Again, this is just me trying to remember because I, what I did in high school, but I think that's that might, I might be wrong with that, but I think that's correct. Something that is divisible by 3 like this, you then can just prove that anything that's divisible by three plus two will also will, will not be divisible by three simply because we're always adding two, right? If something is always divisible by three and we add two, it's never going to be divisible by three. All right. The graph has vertical asymptote and horizontal asymptote write down the equation of the vertical asymptote. All right. So I'll be the first to admit that I always forget which one is which, but that's okay because we can figure it out together. So vertical asymptote means that if I have a graph like this vertical, which means that X is equal to some mystery number. All right. So let's just, if we now look at the actual function up here, for what value of X is this function invalid? Well, if you just look at the function, you see that when X is equal to negative one, the function is invalid. So that's the vertical asymptote. And I think if I remember correctly in the mark scheme, you need to actually like say that VA is equal to X, which is equal to negative one or else you don't get the point. And then the horizontal asymptote is just the other one. And you can actually use the, what was it called? The hospital, L'Hopital. I realized I pronounced it L'Hospital. That was kind of the joke back in the day. You can use the L'Hopital rule here to find the asymptote simply as simply the derivative of the top or the derivative of the, of the bottom, which is just two over one. All right, so that's Y, horizontal, so it's this way. That's your answer for number A. And again, I think you gotta do H, A, horizontal asymptote, or else it doesn't count for whatever reason. Now, on the set of axes below, sketch the graph of this. All right, so we know that Y is this. Let's say Y is two, X is negative one. So this is poorly drawn because the axis here is wrong. So let's just do axis here, axis here, axis here. Whoops, so the graph is either gonna be this way or this way. So we can just see simply by putting an, in a number. So let's see where, when I put X is equal to zero, what happens? Well, I get one on the, let's say, let's say X is equal to zero. This is what I'm thinking in my own head. X times zero minus one is zero plus one, just like this. So in this case, we get negative one because we get this is one, this is zero, negative. So yeah, negative one, which basically means that, excuse me, so Y, <laughs> I thought X was negative one for a second. Whoops, Y is negative one. So when X is zero, Y is negative one, which means it's here. Cool. And just simply by having done these a million times, this shape is gonna be something like this. And you wanna do the exact same to find this value of the intercept, all right? Which I'm not gonna do, but basically just replace x. You just replace y equals to zero into the equation and you solve for x, which I'm not gonna do, but that, that'd be the, the last part of the equation. All right, cool. So consider the binomial expression, this to the power of this, 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 and this, and this. Show that b is equal to 21. All right, let's see what happens, I guess. Show that b, so we can start off by writing the general term of this binomial expression. So let's write this out. T of n, T of n, excuse me, is in this case, it's just it's just the coefficient in front of x, excuse me, it's just x to the power of in this case, seven. So I want n to be larger. So I believe it's just n like this and then one n minus k. Yes. So since T of n, in this case, n is equal to five. So if you look at this case right here, you see that n is equal to five because b of x5, in this case, this is equal to n. So n is equal to five, which means t of five is equal to five k something is equal to like this. Am I missing something? I feel like I'm missing something. This doesn't seem right. Yeah, so if this is five, that means five is equal to n minus r. We know this n is seven, right? Because we have the, the big seven here. So I actually did this wrong. This should be, this should be k, not n. So n is, all right, so I, I the no, my notation is completely wrong here. This n is equal to seven. We go seven like this. k is equal to five in this case. So it's t of k is equal to five, just like that. So let's see, seven, oops, 
seven choose five. If we look at our choose formula. All right, let's 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 take a second here and look at our choose formula. So if we look at our choose formula here, seven factorial over five factorial, factorial like this. So we end up, so the, the strategy here is you wanna do six times five factorial like this, times two, since that's just the same. And then you cancel these out. All right, so that's, that's the aha moment for most students actually, is this right here, knowing that you can expand seven factorial, you can just basically rip it out until you get some type of factorial. So I'll give you another example here. So let's say n minus two factorial over n factorial like this. Turns out that, let's make that plus. Turns out that I can, I can expand out the first two terms like this, and then I can just simply cancel that out. All right, and that's basically what we see right here. We get seven times six divided by two, so one, three, and this is just seven times three, which is 21. All right. So that's your answer for this question right here. Find the possible values of, of x. So the third term in the expansion is the mean of the second term and the fourth term in the expansion. Oh my God. So the this doesn't seem that difficult. You just gotta find a formula right here for the mean which I'm not, I'm not even gonna spend because I don't have that much time. But if you look at this, it's based, it should be a very similar thought process to what I just showed you right there. The third term in the expansion. So let, let's see which term this is. Third term in the expansion. So this is the, the mean of the second term and the fourth term. I'm just trying to remember which one is considered to be the zeroth term and which one is considered to be the third. Yeah, so basically this is pretty straightforward. I just don't remember the notation of the IB. Like it's, it's left me. So because I think this is just an IB thing or I might be completely completely wrong in saying that, but I think it's just an IB thing in that the third term is just a notation. I don't know which term it is. Let's say, it's, let's let's just for sake of argument, just so I can actually write something down. Let's say this right here is the third term. So B of X to the power of five, in other words, 21 x to the power of five, which is which is what I would think because if you look at number A, it says that B is equal to 21. And typically the way that these questions work is that part A gives you some information that you need to solve quickly. Like you don't need the, the information to solve B, but typically if you use the information to solve B, the answer kind of just clicks, right? You find that aha moment and you just get it. So my intuition would be that this right here is the third term, which means that the second term is A of x6. Okay, so this is the, this is the second term right here, which is literally just seven choose six, right? So this is this, and then this is what? Seven, probably do this in your head, seven factorial over six factorial, or just seven times six factorial, and these two cancel out. Boom, so this is just seven x to the power of six. All right, and then this is the mean of the second term and the fourth term in the expansion. So the mean in this case would just be the average between those two and the fourth term. So second, third, fourth. Yeah, so actually this is 100% doable. Assuming I got my mean formula correct. So let's say mean is just the sum of these two terms over two. I could be wrong here, but maybe. So this is what 42 divided by two. I realize that the exponents are the same. That is a goofball mistake. Hmm, whatever. This is equal actually to find the possible value. Oh, I see. Now you're just, yeah, find the possible values of X. So it's just this. Oh, okay, yeah. So me kind of just winging this entire thing sort of worked out. All right, now we're just gonna be left with a quadratic to solve. And hopefully, hopefully you see, hopefully you see why this ends up being a quadratic based on what I have here on the screen. So let's actually write this out. We have minus X to the power of five. This is equal to zero, right? Because it's mean minus that. So we want to solve the possible values of X. First things first, 42, seven. So these are all can be factored out sevens. I can also factor out X to the power of four. Boom, so I already found an answer for X. X is equal to zero. So that's one possible value. So I'm just gonna write that down. X can be equal to zero. So let's factor this out. We have X squared plus five, just five, no X here minus six X. All right, cool. So this is equal to zero. Now we, at this point, it should be clear. The aha moment I think was just matching these two up and then realizing that's just a quadratic that you can factor out. Some students I imagine probably get stuck at this point because they're like, how do I factor this out? Well, fear not because you can just factor out the X to the power of four. Okay, how do I do this? Let's see, so five, five times one. Yeah, so this is how I would do this. Five times one, right? Because if I have six and then it's minus, which means minus, minus like that, boom. And so the answer is X is equal to one and then X is equal to five. All right. I mean, that seems correct, given that it worked out so nicely. Typically, if you're wrong with these questions, you would just get something insane that makes no sense. And it's also paper one. So who knows, like if you get something that you need to like calculate, like I remember, <laughs> I remember there was one kid in my, there was one, one of my friends, his name is, I, I don't think Jack, Jack would mind, but Jack, I remember in one of the chemistry exams, <laughs> One of the practice ones, I think this was the practice mock. It was, it was so funny. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Jack, for calling you out on this, but it was, it was so funny. On one of the paper ones, there was no calculator for chemistry. And one of you, like, there was a mistake 
I think we, I think I made the mistake as well. So I'm not long story short, you made a mistake. I made a mistake. We all made a mistake with this, but you made a mistake with this. And then you, you actually factored it out and you had to like divide everything. You got some nasty thing. And I, I, I felt guilty for this as well, because I actually went ahead and I actually did the division. Like I did the long division. It was something nasty. And I realized that was not on like the multiple choice. It was, it was so dumb. It was so dumb. I, I did that, right? That, that was me. And then <laughs> I remember that Jack did it as well. That that's why I mentioned Jack. It was funny, fun memories of that. All right. So next question, let's see what we got here. Okay. So function F is defined by this the graph is shown by this Ooh. show that f is an odd function okay so this you just use the definition of odd function which if i remember odd function is i mean we can just look at the answer here so let's say you don't know what the definition of odd function is which has the actual definition has escaped my mind right now but i think we can figure this out why do i say that well let's look at this graph right here okay it's like this beautiful drawing skills notice how this x is the the opposite x like this x is positive this x right here is negative and they're basically the exact same of the other so in other words if i do x of one and call this x of two x of one is just negative x of two cool now let's look at y of one which is right here and let's look at y of two notice that y of one is equal to negative of y two therefore the definition of an odd function just based on this right because it says it says right here that show that f is an odd function which means that f is an odd function we just need to show that it is okay so it is an odd function Hence, it satisfies this definition. Therefore, if we have for some function y is equal to f of x, we substitute x is equal to negative one like this. We substitute, make the substitution. Therefore, negative y is equal to f of, that's your definition of an odd function. All right, so you wanna show that this is an odd function, just plug it in, right? And you can actually see it right here if you just plug it into this values. Hopefully you can see y if I have x times square root of one minus x squared, and then I, make x equal to negative x of one. I mean, just substitute that in, what do you get? Okay, this is squared, so this turns into positive. Hence, I can literally just factor this out, just like that. All right, so that's your mini proof. Find the value of a and the value of b. This is the range, so we wanna find these two intercepts. Genuinely don't wanna do this problem. I don't feel like it's, this is the type of problem that I see and I'm like, all right, I know how to do this. Like, like it's, it's function guys, it's not that hard. I know how to do this. Do I wanna do it? No, so I just move on and I'll come back to it later. All right, now let's do some actual interesting stuff. I wanna, I finally, I finally wanted to get to some integrals. All right, so this is exciting. So by using substitution, u is equal to secant x or otherwise, never, no, eh, wrong answer or otherwise. Find an expression for, in terms of n, where n is a non-zero real number. All right, so we have a definite integral here. This is gonna be fun. We know that we need to do the substitution. So let's start by doing the substitution. How about that? So we know that u is equal to secant of x, hence du dx is the derivative of this, which I do not remember. What is the derivative of secant? It's one over cosine. So utilizing the chain rule, what is that tangent? Is that tangent? Let's see, let's actually do this together, shall we? So this is cosine of negative one like this. Let's bring down the, so let's bring down the negative here. Cosine X, go negative two times the ins, inside function, which is just negative of sine of X, which is just sine of X over cosine squared of X. In other words, sine of X, secant squared X. Boom, that does seem correct. So congrats. Oh, whoops, I realized I skipped this. All right, so we need to somehow find an expression for this. All right, so I'm gonna do the following. We know that secant is this, so this is u to the power of n. Now we know that this is du dx, hence du is equal to, is equal to the following, look. So, all right, I, I, I see how to solve this. So essentially we see that we can rewrite this expression right here. Let me go full screen for you. We can rewrite this expression right here as tangent of X divided by cosine of X like this, right? And if you, and if you don't see why that's the case, all right, this right here is that. And we know that this right here is tangent of X. Cool. So tangent of X is equal to this. We can then multiply this by D of X. Yeah, that, that's how this works. So essentially D of X is here. Now we see that we see right there, ladies and gentlemen, if we look at the answer or the question, excuse me. By the way, I do, <laughs> I, I misspoke there. I do not have the answers. I'm not looking at the answers. What you're seeing on my screen is exactly what I'm looking at. Just want to make 100% sure. I did not look at answers. I genuinely don't know. This is just me doing stuff from the top of my head, not having done the IB in a few years. All right. So let's go back here. We have tangent here, cosine. So we know that if we look at the question, we know that we have tangent of x dx inside of the actual integral. Okay, and this is the integral of secant and like this. So we know that this part right here is part of the integral. Hence, I can just rewrite this in the following way. This is actually kind of fun. I, I, I enjoyed, strange as this might sound, I somewhat enjoyed calculus. All right, so we know secant of x is simply tangent of x like this. All right, so why do I care, Joaquin? Why is this important? Well, I'm glad you asked because it turns out that I can make the substitution, meaning that tangent of x 
let's make this full screen, x dx is equal to just du over secant of x like that. And if we make the substitution, let's just open this back up. So we have u of n like this. We make this substitution into here. So we have du over secant of x. Now we already know how to rewrite this in terms of u. So we can rewrite this in terms of u over u of du. All right, cool. Now we just need to actually do the, the definite integral, which is kind of annoying. And this is where I would stop because that right there, ladies and gentlemen, was the aha moment. All right, the aha moment in this question was, okay, somewhere here is just you either understand to make this substitution or you don't, and it just kind of clicks. The rest is just plugging numbers in and then taking the antiderivative, which, I mean, you can do that. I'm not saying don't. Obviously you want to get the marts, but that's the easy part of the, that's the easy part of the question. The difficult part of the question is rearranging this in terms of you. All right, and realize there's a lonely integral right here. Let's delete that. Excellent. All right, I'm going to end it right here simply because we've already hit the limit. Thanks again for watching. This was just me <laughs> kind of doing these questions. Hopefully you see my, my thought process more than anything, the way I approach these questions, the way I do this. When it comes to actually practicing, obviously this is kind of how I would do it. Just doing as many as possible, as fast as possible. In an actual exam, this is not what I would do, but take it as you will. Hopefully that helped. If you have any questions at all, please let me know. And until next time, Time. Stay grizzly, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. Bye.